Fascinatingly, I think this movie needed more Michael Bay. Yes, welcome to the spoiler review for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If you haven't seen the movie, you can click here to watch my non-spoiler review. But if you have seen the movie, don't mind spoilers or don't intend to see the movie, well then, let's get down to business. Uh, as always, I'm going to go by character because I think that's the best way to break down these movies. But actually, I'm going to start with Michael Bay because his fingerprints are all over this thing. Now, why do I think that it needs more Michael Bay? Well, as I said in my non-spoiler review, the film just never gets to an 11, and that's Michael Bay's specialty in terms of action, uh, humor, and spectacle. And all of those elements were missing here. This was like a muted Transformers film. Uh, maybe you could say Transformers for kids, but kids love Transformers movies. It's one of the reasons they do so well at the box office. Uh, so this one, maybe there was too much story, maybe there was too much script, maybe Michael Bay can't work with the script. But he was only producing here, and Jonathan Liebsman does a pretty good job at pseudo-Bay, but he's not the uh, authentic thing. He's not the real deal. Uh, oh, although I must say, and I was very impressed, I'll get to this uh, in a moment, about the female characters in the film. That was really a shocker, considering it was a Michael Bay film. But he did manage to get one Victoria's Secret shout-out at the end of the movie. I don't want to give it away, but uh, I am just surprised at Michael Bay's insistence in including Victoria's Secret in his films. I don't know if he has some kind of deal with Victoria's Secret, or if my, maybe Michael Bay is just a really big fan of Victoria's Secret. I would suspect both. But I think he deserves credit for doing a nice job with this material and making it seem very current. Uh, I think that, you know, there were some explosions after all, and uh, uh, sh uh, Shredder, I always mix up Splinter and Shredder. I'm not a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, so please take that into account when, my, when you're uh, listening to my review. But with um, uh, Shredder, Shredder moved like a Transformer, and they had those, you know, trademark bay shots where Shredder would move very slowly in his metal armor, and there was, like, heat waves, you know, the humidity in the air to kind of create that cool kind of, like, uh, uh, artistic almost look, and so you were just like, oh look, there must be like some kind of lens or special effect filter that Michael Bay just gives all of his editors, and he's like, plaster that on a few shots. But I think, you know, I think Michael Bay, I'm not a Bay hater, I appreciate Michael Bay for who he is and what he's become. Uh, of course, I think he made better films in the beginning of his career with like The Rock and The Island. The Island, little Little known gem, Ewan McGregor, Scarlett Johansson, if you ever need a movie to watch. I believe they play it on HBO quite a bit, or at least they were. Go check it out. Bad Boys, you know, the guy has talent. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's followed the money, and there's he's found a lot of it. There's been a lot of money at the end of this 80s rainbow. Uh, and we'll see if Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, is another little pile for him. Uh, so let's move on to the characters in the film. I have to start with Megan Fox because she was extremely well utilized in this movie. Just like Keira Knightley recently and a couple other actresses, if you told me I would ever enjoy Megan Fox in a movie, I would have said you were crazy. But she was really good. And this has been a great summer for female action heroes. Uh, I think we're, you know, Lucy with Scarlett Johansson, uh, of course, Hunger Games, Frozen, Gravity. I think this is really genuinely starting a trend. And it has to, because when it when it crosses over into a Michael Bay film, Hollywood is clearly taking notice that people like seeing female heroes. And April O'Neil was actually, I think, the most, the best realized uh, female action hero that, you know, I perhaps potentially ever seen. Because she was a real person. She wasn't, she didn't have extraordinary abilities like Lucy. She wasn't like, they didn't really uh, hammer home her flaws, like, for instance, uh, um, Sandra Bullock's character in Gravity. She wasn't like, she could do no, she couldn't do no wrong like Angelina Jolie in every Angelina Jolie movie, except for Maleficent. And I think that's why Maleficent was so well received for Jolie, because she did have flaws and uh, humanity and made some mistakes. But Megan Fox was just a great character. So great that I think in the past it would totally have been played by a guy. And it's almost to the point where they took that role, that Shia LaBeouf role, and just gave it to Megan Fox. And they didn't pretty much rewrite it at all because they put a, a woman in the role. Kind of what they were supposed to do with Salt, with Jolie, back to Jolie. Uh, but, you know, with Salt it still felt very much like a... Angelina Jolie role, very tailored to her in terms of sex appeal, and that she was like uh, an uber action hero who could, you know, who was unfazable. Uh, but Megan Fox, you know, was more on the lines of, say, an Indiana Jones character, uh, or, you know, uh, John McClane. I know you're, some of you are going to be like tearing your hair out, being like, what are you talking about, Grace? But if you see the movie, you'll definitely see 
the the elements there and you know but but without like the you know she wasn't like yippee ki mofo uh megan fox had a lot of humility as april o'neill which i also appreciated uh and seeing her interact with whoopi goldberg as the head of the the new six channel six where she worked and the female henchman uh who was there you know just to be a henchman and not to be the hot henchman was just really cool to see and i i got a strong a strong uh, kick out of it, strong enjoyment. Uh, but I d we're going to talk about a bunch of male characters next. I don't want you to think that this is some um, chick flick all of a sudden. Uh, it's just exciting to see women in these kinds of roles and to see, therefore, a very well-balanced movie. Uh, so uh, let's move over, actually, to the Turtles, because uh, we're going to discuss the Turtles' origin story, which actually has a lot to do with April O'Neil. Now, I believe this is not how it went down in the animated series, but please forgive me if I'm wrong. As I said again, not a fan. Uh, but they changed it so that these were April O'Neil's childhood pets. Her father was a scientist who worked for this corporation. He died tragically in a fire. And a uh, April O'Neil, who liked to hang out at her dad's lab, filming that, filming it even then for her little, her little news reports, uh, very much like a Lois Lane type character. Very well done. If Megan Fox was a better actress, I would say, hey, she'd be a great Lois Lane. But uh, alas, that is not the case. If they could somehow combine Amy Adams and Megan Fox into one person, it would be Lois Lane or Terry Hatcher. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I would say, actually, I do see a lot of similarities to Terry Hatcher back before she became a little annoying. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the turtles were April O'Neil's childhood pets, and I thought that was great. I thought that was so wonderful because I think it made it tie in more for the kid audience, that your pets could someday grow up to be these big action heroes who you could fight to fight uh, fight evil with, to, sa to save the day. So I just thought that was, I thought that was a really clever, organic way to, to tie in April O'Neil to their origin story. Sure. It's a little bit, you know, a little too on the nose, a little too Hollywood luck that she is the one who discovers them uh, because she discovers them just by accident. It has nothing to do with their hanging out near her father's old lab, etc., etc. It's just one heck of a coincidence. But still, that notwithstanding, it was overall, I thought, very clever. And also the way that she, ins she, she was the one responsible for them liking pizza. She's the one who named them because it was Project Renaissance. And then also uh, with their the, the, the rat Splinter, she named that. And also she inspired Splinter to take care of the turtles because she had taken care of them. And Splinter had seen the way her father had taken care of her. And so that was really nice and did create the sense of family that April O'Neil says at the end of the film, that they're all family, which makes Michelangelo continuously hitting on her a little creepy, but still, it was a lot of fun. So, and also, by the way, so the turtles when they grow up, I thought the turtles were great when they grew up. I thought they looked good. I didn't. I still don't get their appeal, but uh, I could see people, kids watching this, watching this movie and being like, I want to take martial arts lessons because that was pretty cool. And I think this movie really uh, underscored that you know the fact that you have to train and you have to work hard. These these, kids, these turtles were like the um, the Tiger Woods of. Uh, ninjaing that he is to golf because they've been training since they were just little kids and they became like ninja prodigies and they were also I guess this uh, mutagen that they were given uh, that April O'Neil's father helped create was like steroids but they were pretty jacked for teenagers I was like you look like full-blown adults to me are you sure it's like on, the, on those little league teams when you're like are you sure that's a kid and they're like no yeah but like he has a mustache and they're like his hormones are just raging so I guess that was kind of the situation here but I wouldn't have taken uh, I would think I would say I think the mutagen speeds up your aging process because you look not like teenagers. But one thing uh, I liked about the turtles in general before we get into them specifically, I loved the elevator scene. That was, I wish the movie had operated at that level throughout because they're, they're taking the elevator up and they do the beatboxing and you know of course Michelangelo starts it but everybody else kind of joins in because they have this camaraderie and they are teenagers at heart. Uh, I thought that was that was great. And I think that if the movie had um, kept that quality throughout, it would have been a stronger film. Uh, I, I know they released that clip also in advance, and I, I question, I mean, I guess they have to just make sure they get people into the theater, but it was as one of the few high points of the film where it really clicked, where it was firing on all cylinders, still not to an 11, but darn close. Uh, it's too bad to have that ruined for some people. All right, let's get into our turtles. Leonardo, the leader, voiced by Johnny Knoxville. As I said in my non-spoiler review, you couldn't really tell it was voiced by Johnny Knoxville. Why Johnny Knoxville would play a straight character instead of the comedic one seems crazy to me. Although I guess they were like, the, the actor doing Michelangelo's voice was so good, they were like, we just can't replace him. But uh, Leonardo was actually the least developed of the of the team, and as leaders often are, unfortunately. Uh, uh, but I thought that, you know, he did come across as a leader and, uh, you know, I would have listened to him, but I guess I wouldn't have hung out with him or shared a pizza with him. 
Ah, too bad, Michael. Uh, uh, Leonardo, I apologize. Uh, but then over to Michelangelo, Mikey in the yellow. He's the one who really caught my attention in the trailers, and I think he continued to catch it in the movie. Very funny lines. Uh, he was the, you know, the humor in the film. He did a nice job. But not only with the dialogue, but I thought that the animators did a nice job with his expressions, his demeanor. Uh, everything worked perfectly together. He was that guy in the group. You know, the guy who makes jokes, sometimes makes a little too many jokes, and you're like, it's quiet time. This is, we're taking this seriously. Or, that wasn't that funny. You know, just rapid fire and hoping something will stick. And just like here, sometimes the jokes really stuck. Sometimes they didn't, and he was just trying too hard. But I think that this this one came across the best, uh, Michelangelo, and was my favorite. If I had to, like, if they were, I mean, I got the red mask, as you saw from my non-spoiler review, because I, you know, I just thought I liked red. I was like, I think that'll be cool. Uh, and I think, to some degree, I am a little bit like Raphael sometimes. Uh, but I thought that uh, uh, Mikey, if I had to get like a little action figure or something from the film, it would be it would be with him. Uh, then Donatello in the purple. I, you know, I had to make, you know, they don't really do a good job of uh, establishing which one is which, so I think only diehard fans would know. So I have all their little colors next to their name so I can keep track of it. Uh, so Donatello was in purple, and they also added glasses for Donatello, or Donnie, uh, and I thought the glasses were a nice touch. I thought this character was my second favorite, also very well realized. I like the bow staff. I was like, hey, Gambit! Gambit's gonna be so cool when they finally make a movie with him and they do a good job. Don't drop the ball, Channing Tatum. Uh, but I thought this was very good. And you know, he was the, te he was the classic uh, you know, tech nerd in the group. He could answer all the questions. And he did a good job, and he didn't always have the answer. Although, by the way, on a side note, wasn't it funny when he was April O'Neil was like, what do I do? And I like that she asked for help. April didn't always know what to do. Like, they often have uh, heroes, or often female heroes do. Uh, and Donatello was like, the adrenaline, we need a shot of adrenaline. And I like there was just a big adrenaline button, and she just had to press it. I was like, that's also very convenient. Thank goodness everything's so clearly labeled in this lab. Uh, so Donatello, I liked him uh, a lot. And then uh, Raphael with the red mask, I thought Raphael had the best emotional arc in the film. I liked that he was angry at first, and then at the end, you discovered it's because just because he cared. I thought it was going a little too far when he was like, I don't know if I deserve to fight alongside you guys. And I was like, mm, you know, I never saw that. But I liked the idea of him, you know, pushing people and pushing the rest of the team because he wanted to see them succeed and reach their full potential. That I bought. Uh, so I liked it, and I actually ended up caring for Raphael, I guess, because we spent a lot of time with him because he didn't get captured. But I was like, ah, he was like grumpy. That's how best I can describe it. Like the Grumpy Dwarf, you know, in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, and everyone like, always likes Grumpy and sometimes relate to Grumpy. That was Raphael. He was the Grumpy Turtle. Now, on to Splinter, voiced by Tony Shalhoub. Here I was like, that's Tony Shalhoub. And he did a pretty good job. I think Splinter translated the worst to the special effects. It looked believable there was a giant rat there, but for some reason, I never felt it wasn't a computer. I mean, obviously it was a special effect because they can't find a rat that big, although... Who knows in New York City? Uh, but I thought that Splinter, I was just very aware that Megan Fox and company were interacting with a computer-generated character. Uh, kind of like when you watch like Alvin and the Chipmunks and such. This, the turtles were more convincing. Uh, but you know what? Splinter had a lot of heart. Uh, I don't know how he uh, taught himself being a ninja, though. Just because he found that very uh, helpful book that had like il illustrations in it and lots of diagrams. I'm like, where is that book? That's an awesome book. But I would think you would need someone to teach you. I would think it would be hard to pick it up just from these little, uh, you know, silhouette drawings and like what looked to me like a children's book on being a ninja. But wh whatever, he was good. And I also liked the way he used his tail. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but you know, his character didn't have a lot to do. Uh, but I thought had some heart, added some heart to the team, and I did care when he was in danger and, you know, Shredder was really wiping the floor with them. Now let's move on to Shredder. Shredder, interesting villain. I liked the Asian influence overall in this film, and I wonder how it's going to play in the Asian box office, you know, uh, the, the Holy Trinity to Hollywood these days, China, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, but I liked those elements. I thought that Shredder was well realized, and Shredder was actually a dangerous, scary villain who meant business, who was effective. You know, that's a problem I've been having with some of the Marvel movies lately that we've been discussing, and even some of the DC movies. Their villains just aren't that much of a threat at the end of the day. The heroes end up being their own biggest obstacle in both, you know, cinematic universes, DC and uh, Marvel. But here, Shredder was legitimately a problem. And he, you know, I liked it that the Turtles were having a hard time defeating him. When Raphael was like, getting our butts kicked, I was like, you really are. This is kind of embarrassing. Uh, you are not well trained. But I thought that Shredder, so Shredder was very well done, uh, and I thought was a compelling villain. Even though at the end of the day, again, I totally don't get this, the popularity of this entire thing. You know, I was like, when they had, uh, 
Shredder fighting uh, Raphael and they're having this big throwdown in the warehouse or at Stack's estate in the lab, I was like, wow, if I was a fan of this, this probably would be really cool that this was finally being realized at such a scale with such special effects. But I don't get the appeal of this whole thing. Uh, speaking of Sachs, uh, Eric Sachs, you know, he was just there to be uh, the human counterpart and for to be a, a you know, a, a fake out for April O'Neil. And William Fichter, this is, he could play this role in his sleep, and if you told me he did play this role in his sleep, I would believe you. They'd be like, he slept well through that whole movie, and I'd be like, eh, he's a good sleepwalker, he's good. You know, he was the villain in The Lone Ranger, etc. He just always does this, and, you know, he has an interesting look and an interesting voice, and I think it's well utilized, often by Michael Bay. Uh, and then last but not least, Will Arnett. I really liked his role here. I thought that he didn't really give him enough to do, but, you know, they couldn't have Will Arnett and Michelangelo. You can't have the two funny guys. Of course, Will Arnett captured my heart as Lego Batman in uh, the Lego movie this year. I thought he was so good. Uh, so I was a little disappointed he didn't have more to do, but I could understand why. Uh, and I also thought that they did a really nice job of having some romance between him and Megan Fox. Uh, although, I thought it was funny when he was like, Nothing worse than dropping, uh, you know, uh, a, a pretty girl off at a rich guy's house. And he referred to uh, Eric Sachs as an old guy. And I was like, Will Arnett, I think you and William Fitchner are pretty much on the same uh, age level demographic wise. I don't really think you should go around calling anyone an old man. What's with the ageism, Arnett? Because uh, I think that in a lot of different directors and producers wouldn't have cast Will Arnett opposite Megan Fox, but I thought it was refreshing and I thought it was realistic, uh, considering their relationship and where, what his job was, etc. And I thought I was kind of rooting for them as a couple. I liked that he wanted to ask her out, but because they worked together, etc., he was having a hard time figuring out exactly how to do it. I thought it was very well realized and um, it seemed very realistic to me and it made his character endearing. And as I, I was going to say, uh, Will Arnett had enough to do, and he was, uh, you know, able to contribute enough to the movie that he didn't just seem, you know, like Lucy when that French police detective is just following her around, you know, literally following her around like a dog. You were like, this is a little embarrassing for both of you. Here, Will Arnett had stuff to do. He, you know, they found a good way to get him out of the action when necessary, and I just thought it was well realized. It's like, you know what, it's the girl's turn to be the hero, but the guy's still awesome and, you know, respected. So I liked that. So as you can see, I liked aspects of the movie, but I um, actually liked a lot of the film, but it just never escalated to where I needed it to be to have a good time, to have a really good time. I enjoyed it. It was like, again, there's those movies where you're like, I want to go into an air-conditioned theater uh, and just turn my brain off. That's totally what this is. And there's not anything in it really to annoy you or take you out of it, like a recent movie, because I know some of you are going to be like, well, why didn't you just apply that logic to Guardians of the Galaxy? But if you go and you watch my review, you can see why. There were a lot of little things that took me out of that movie. Nothing took me out of this movie. I would say it was like a solid Saturday morning cartoon, uh, but live action. So that's my spoiler review of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If you've seen the movie, please leave your own uh, thoughts down below. Thank you so much for tuning in, and you can check out some more episodes right now.